Hello everyone and welcome to this new edition of Eco Africa, The Environment Show. I'm Neo Taegbe coming to you from Abuja, Nigeria and joining me of course is my colleague Sandra Twinobio. Hello Sandra. Hi Neote and hello everybody. Thank you all for joining us on the program where we look at stories on how to make our planet greener and thereby making it better. Well, here are some of the stories that we'll be looking at today. We'll hear about a simple environment project that is having a big effect in Ghana. We will meet a scientist in Germany looking to replant land devastated by coal mining. And we'll see how Bedouins in Egypt are returning to a more sustainable way of life. But we begin in Rwanda, where the prolonged use of illegal and regulated fishing gear has led to the collapse of fish stocks. A number of lakes have been left severely understocked, and that has led to an increase in malnutrition among the local population. Prices on the local market have also risen over the last two decades, and that trend is expected to continue if fish production is not stimulated. So Rwanda has embarked on a vast operation to restock its 24 lakes. We went to see how things are coming along. Rwanda on the eastern shore of Lake Kivu. It might look idyllic, but the fishers of Nyamyumba are finding it more and more difficult to scrape by. Lake Kivu is severely overfished as are some of the nearly two dozen lakes in the country. Lake Kivu mainly contains sardines and various types of tilapia. Official figures say almost 19,000 tons of fish were caught in its waters in 2018, which accounted for 70% of Rwanda's entire fish haul. But stocks are dwindling. In previous years, a fisherman could catch between three to four kilograms a day, but at this stage you can spend a week on the lake and net barely two kilograms. The fish market in Nyamuyumba, because fully grown fish are increasingly scarce, juvenile fish are also on sale, even though it is against the law, and the shortages are also leading to spiraling prices. The price of fish has increased a lot. Whenever the catch is poor, the price per kilo goes up. Our business is in danger because the prices depend on the fish that is available to us. The dwindling fish stocks are also adversely affecting Lake Kivu's ecosystems. This scientist is monitoring the water quality and algae density. The fish feed off the algae. As their numbers decline, the algae is able to grow unhindered. It's a vicious cycle. High uh, quantity of that will create uh, a shadow on water, on the top of the water, which can pro prevent oxygen to enter in deep water. So any organism in the water will lack oxygen, it will die eventually. The Rwandan government aims to tackle the problem with an ambitious program to boost fish stocks. Uh -huh. We are currently in the process of restocking tilapia and other declining fish species across the lakes in Rwanda. Tilapia reproduce in the shallows close to the shore, and that makes them highly vulnerable to illegal fishermen who net all the fish. One hatchery is in Kigembe in the south of the country. It breeds types of fish found in lakes across Rwanda. This tilapia is protecting its freshly hatched offspring in its mouth. We select a good sample of the fish from our lakes and rivers and bring them to these ponds to ray. When they reach reproduction age, we collect their eggs in the hatchery. Eggs are being removed from this catfish. The process does not harm the female. After sperm is added to the eggs, they are taken into the incubation pool which is heated to the ideal temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. Days later, the tiny catfish emerge. Lake Mugesaram, just southeast of the capital Kigali, is one of the first lakes where the specially bred fry are being released. Catfish, along with various types of tilapia. 
Twice a year, there is a two-month fishing ban in all lakes to allow the stocks to recover. Back at Lake Kivu, fishers are also hoping that the fish stocks here will be replenished. There is also some acknowledgement that the problems are partly homegrown. Not all fishermen abide by the rules. Some use nets with a mesh size, so fine they can be used for mosquito nets. They trap everything they come across. It's a problem, but I also think the authorities have some responsibility they should impose stricter sanctions. But penalizing the fish poachers will not be enough to ensure that Lake Kivu recovers. There has to be a change in overall awareness if the fish populations are to be kept stable. To Europe now, where the latest report from the World Meteorological Organization says that 2020 is said to be one of the hottest years on record. Rising temperatures are causing ice in the polar regions to melt and sea levels to rise, threatening to wipe entire areas off the map. That's right, Sandra, and it's happening at an alarming rate. It's all down to global warming caused by rising greenhouse gas emissions. Worldwide, there are many strategies aimed at reducing carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. Planting trees is one of them. But modern technology allows for other creative options too, as our next report from Iceland shows. What better place to save the planet from global warming than Iceland? It has energy to spare. Everywhere the ground is in motion. Scientists call it an active volcanic area. Icelanders have long realized that the country's hot springs can serve as more than tourist attractions. A half hour's drive east of the capital Reykjavik lies the Hedgeshady power station. It's been generating electricity and heat from steam since 2006. It's become one of the world's biggest geothermal power plants. But there's another reason why scientists, entrepreneurs and reporters are now flocking here. They want to meet with Edda Aradotter, the CEO of a company called CarbFix. It's working to reverse the greenhouse effect, albeit on a small scale. Basically what is happening is that we are sucking the atmosphere through this machine. Uh, the CO2 sticks to a specific chemical uh, within the, this unit. And so what comes out at the back is a much cleaner uh, atmosphere with, with much lower CO2 content than what came in. They began using this kind of vacuum cleaner for carbon dioxide eight years ago. In one of the pumping stations, Edda Aradotter explains what happens to the CO2. So here we have a, an underground pipe transporting um, the CO2 that was captured at the capture plant. Uh, and it is dissolved in water. And this is then what we inject into the subsurface, several hundred meters underground. The CO2 then reacts with the basalt rock and is stored there permanently. It's a method that works especially well in the volcanic rock here. This is a piece of basaltic core. We see the CO2 both filling uh, veins within the, within the basalt or fractures, but also the pores. Uh, so gradually, uh, this, all of these, these still open pores could fill up with mineralized CO2, depending on how much we inject. The technology is still very expensive, it also consumes a lot of water and can only be used in specific terrain. Still, CarbFix is convinced that this technology will eventually help to reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere worldwide. Few countries in the world are feeling the effects of climate change as acutely as Iceland. Its once mighty glaciers are shrinking continually. So Iceland's environment minister is taking action. The Icelandic government aims to make the country CO2 neutral by 2040. To do this, they're relying on new technologies and a belief in ancient sagas. We have these stories in Iceland that trolls became stones when they, if they were exposed to sun. And we can say that we are trying to um, turn CO2 into stone, whereas trolls were turned into stone when they met the sun. Icelanders know they can't save the planet on their own. 
but they're developing technologies that other countries can also employ in the future. And the idea that believing in elves and trolls can also help does not bother anyone here. And back to Africa now. When young people get hold of a good idea and start putting it into action, they can be unstoppable. And when others see that it's making a difference, word suit gets around and the next thing you know, they are on the Eco Africa Doing Your Bit segment. Take a look at our heroes this week in Ghana. These plastic bottles, 5,000 in all, used to litter the streets of Accra. Now they're part of an effort to inspire pupils at the Tima International School to join the recycling revolution. The unusual trash collection centre was set up by four schoolgirls. There was a lot of plastic waste bottles around the school, so the school wasn't exactly looking as decent as it should be looking. So we wanted to find a way to reduce the amount of plastic waste bottles in the school and in our environment. The girls spent two months collecting trash with the help of their fellow pupils, from the streets to the beaches and in streams. After being cleaned and sorted, the bottles are strung together and stacked. Recycling training consultant Makafui Awuku has been providing assistance. We feel very disappointed when we see the plastics around because we feel that the people of Ghana are not educated as citizens of why this is horrible and why it is hurting our environment. The collected waste is sold to recycling companies with the proceeds helping to fund new environment projects at the school. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. The number of coronavirus cases in Egypt has gone down significantly since the summer, but the country's tourism industry is yet to recover. That's affected many Bedouins, in particular who work as tour guides or take jobs in hotels and shops in the resorts along the Red Sea. Many of them decided to go back to their families and communities in the mountains, often seeing no alternative. The upside to this radical change is that they've returned to their traditional way of life in harmony with nature and the environment. In St. Catherine, home of the Jabalia Bedouin, COVID-19 has brought tourism to a complete halt. Those working in the industry have been left without income. Many Jabalier have returned to a more traditional way of life. Some have gardens that are a thousand years old. Sayed Musa Muhammad has revived his family garden to grow food. More than half the Jabalier here in St. Catherine work in tourism. There are a few other jobs or ways to earn an income. So we've begun to live as our fathers and grandfathers did, from our own gardens. He grows various vegetables. He also has some grafted trees, a technique used widely here. This is a grafted tree. We took a bitter almond tree and grafted a plum tree onto it. It's doing well. Tending to fruit trees is a long-standing tradition amongst the Jabalia Bedouin. Hakim Ahmed Mansu Diguni owns one of the oldest gardens in the area and has been tending to it for decades. He's been encouraging other Bedouins to return to their roots. The modern urban lifestyle does not suit us. It does not appeal to our nature. Our nature is Bedouin. The main challenge the Bedouin face in their gardening is the lack of rain. Water is scarce. This year, winter rains filled up the granite aquifer, but that isn't always the case. The people here have to adapt to the water shortages. What grows most here are almonds and pomegranate, because they tolerate drought. The water we use is rainwater from the wells. Sometimes there's rain, sometimes there's none. 
The altitude and weather creates an ideal microclimate for growing trees and vegetables, an advantage over other regions in Egypt. In drought periods, when the wells don't provide enough irrigation water, the Bedouin irrigates from wells high in the mountains. Mahmoud Mansour Diguni, a Bedouin elder with a vast knowledge of plants and trees, is happy that people have returned to their gardens. If they grow some fruit trees and some vegetables, like tomatoes, zucchinis, plus other greens, and have some livestock so they can get a bit of milk, they don't need anything else from outside. He grows pistachios and almonds. These provide him with a cash crop to generate income. Pistachios are expensive. A pistachio tree can yield 15 to 20 kilos, so that's good money. Almonds are expensive too. Nuts fetch good money, and they grow especially well here in St. Catherine. Owning livestock, growing food, and keeping fruit orchards is part of the Jabalia way of life. Now, in these changed circumstances, falling back on this traditional lifestyle is proven to be a lifesaver. We're off to Europe once more, to a region in eastern Germany where lignite or brown coal, as it's sometimes known, was mined for decades. The mining destroyed habitats, leaving behind a desolate landscape that looks something like the surface of the moon. It is a strange sight, isn't it, Nilte? And as you can guess, nothing grows there at all. But there is hope. Conservationists believe that these devastated areas can be replanted one biologist from the region is very keen to see them restored to the way they looked in her childhood. For decades, extracting lignite coal from open cast mines ensured energy supplies and provided jobs in this region in eastern Germany. But when burned, lignite produces huge amounts of CO2 emissions, which makes it incompatible with Germany's move towards green energy. Christina Gretz grew up in a village that was destroyed to make way for the mines. Today, the biologist is helping to bring new life to the ravaged landscape. This meadow is part of a 1,200-hectare conservation area where rare plants can grow undisturbed. As a botanist, being here brings tears to my eyes. It just warms my heart because it's so beautiful. 90% of this vegetation is on the red list of threatened species. Dubbed the Green Heart, this was the first section of the former open-cast mine to be restored in 2009. Gretz is working in cooperation with a local coal company. I see these former mining landscapes as an opportunity for nature, huge spaces solely for plants and animals without any development. In the future, the ecological restoration concept will be carried out in other spaces like solar parks, the panels are often installed in fields with little plant variety, but here a special blend of regional flowers are blooming. Not far from the open mine site, Gretz has a nursery where she and her team raise wild and rare flowers for regional and EU conservation projects. Here on her company's farm, they produce various seed mixes. Unlike cultivated plants, the seeds of the wild varieties aren't all ready for harvest at the same time so they're collected by hand, a labor-intensive job. In the case of the greater knapweed, the fields have to be checked every day so as to catch the moment before the wind carries the seeds away. Conservation law in Germany requires that only regional seeds be used in such restoration projects. And Gretz's company is one of the first to offer them, along with expert advice and plant rescue and ant relocation. Nothing is considered too small. Every little thing in nature, on this planet, in the universe, is somehow interconnected. We belong together. And that includes us humans. And if I lose a part of it, then I lose a part of the whole, and a bit of myself. And that's where I get my motivation. When international companies set up shops in Africa, all too often, 
profit takes precedence over human rights and environmental concerns. One community near Mombasa had a particularly traumatic experience when a recycling plant opened in the community. The company extracted highly toxic lead from old batteries. Many in the village became extremely ill as a result. Local mother and activist Feliz Omido began addressing the issue publicly. She pursued the case through the courts and got the plant closed and won compensation for local residents. Eco Africa paid her a visit. Every time Phyllis Omido returns to Owino Uhuru, she gets a heartfelt welcome, as people briefly discard the usual coronavirus precautions. For residents of this informal settlement on the outskirts of Mombasa, the eco-activist is a heroine. Her fight is one that began over 10 years ago behind this wall. A factory there recycled old car batteries, many of them from Western industrialized nations. But the ultimate cost was borne by the residents of Owino Uhuru, their health. This is where the pollution plant was. The, um, the chimneys were going up, but you see, lead is a heavy metal, so it can't go anywhere. It used to go up and land back into the community. In 2007, she was hired by the factory's owners to oversee relations with the local community, only to see her two-year-old son fall ill due to lead poisoning. Other villagers also reported symptoms. Over 200 of them died, more than 30 of them children. This is their last modest resting place. We have buried uh, more than 30 children who have already been born, lived, and died in this area from lead poisoning. 30 children and miscarriages and stillborns, more than 270 from this community. Omido decided to take action and to challenge the corruption, injustice, and lies. Her efforts earned her a series of death threats, but after years of campaigning for the people of Owino Uhuru, she was also rewarded with the closure of the plant in 2014. Progress that came too late to change much for Irene Akini. Her thyroid gland is still swollen, and her blood still contains more than 80 times the amount of lead considered unsafe. Ten years ago, her father and brother worked in the plant, extracting lead from the used car batteries. When they came back home, Irene would wash their clothes. Even before the tests, I suffered a lot. I would get sick with a fever all the time. Sometimes I'd hallucinate, and sometimes my body would shake so hard I was unable to hold anything in my hands. Then, when I received the test results, I was told I had 420 micrograms of lead per deciliter in my blood. I was so traumatized. Anything over 5 micrograms per deciliter is considered high. The relentless work of Phyllis Omido and her fellow activists brought a further breakthrough in the summer of 2020, when they won a class action suit against the factory owners and the Kenyan environmental authorities. The community was rewarded 1.3 billion Kenyan shillings, or 10 million euros. The compensation is yet to be paid to the residents of Owino Uhuru due to an appeal by the defendants, but Omido remains confident. I'm looking forward to a day when everyone in Onohuru would be able to receive treatment. A day when I'll come here and I'll call you and you'll see doctors here, international doctors in this community, pitching tent, treating the people. I'll call you here and we'll be remediating the community, changing the ounces, giving it a facelift and giving the children the much needed uh, health care that they need. The judge overseeing the case also ordered the government to remove the lead from the ground and water of Owino Uhuru or pay the costs. One day soon, the community will hopefully be able to enjoy healthy lives again. That is it for today's show. Hope you enjoyed watching and that you've learned something new about your environment and why it is so important to take care of it. It is a goodbye from me, Sandra Twinobio, here in Kampala, Uganda. And of course, I'll be looking forward to seeing you once again next week.
And it's goodbye from me too in Abuja, Nigeria. I'm Neo Taegwe. If you want to know more or if you have ideas of your own, then look us up on social media and write us a message. See you soon and make sure to tune in for the next edition of Eco Africa.